So I'm Scotty Jones. Um, I live in Alsea, Oregon, which is two hours south of Portland on a farm we call Leaping Lamb Farm. Uh, and we came to this farm 20 years ago. My background is retail, marketing, hospitality, all a little bit kind of all mushed together. And then it was farming. And when we got there, I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do anything here. And I had all this other background. In the end, it's all kind of worked out. Um, I am there with my husband. And so he has the same expression as our donkey. And that's how he is as a farmer. And so in terms of hospitality, I'm the one that does the hospitality. <laughs> Uh, so our farm is actually a uh, 1890s homestead. We're on 65 acres. We uh, do livestock production, so we produce lamb for market. And we do have very large gardens. We do divide our uh, work. So my husband takes care of the plants. I take care of the livestock because I just kill plants. Doesn't matter that we're in Oregon. But it did take us a little while. We were romantically diluted um, urbanites when we moved to the farm. And we thought that farming would pay for the farm. So in about 2006, it was kind of a reality check. What are we gonna do? Hey, let's offer a farm stay because I'm not going anywhere anyway. My definition of a farm stay is that it is lodging on a working farm or ranch. And that's really important to me these days and you'll see why at the end. But so this is what we actually offer um, it's an experiential vacation for families. Uh, that's kind of who we focus on. We want them to get the sights, the sounds, the smells, to really get hands on. Uh, we are not programmed. So if people want to come help us with chores, that's great. If they want to sit on the deck and watch us, that's fine too. Um, but we do have friendly animals and we have friendly people. I have a cottage and I have a farmhouse. Um, those are our farm stays at this point. We just started with the cottage and we added the farmhouse about five years ago. Uh, but we do everything except for meals. We do provide the makings for breakfast and we do let our guests collect eggs so they can add that to their breakfast. We do have a greenhouse where we let them graze so they can pick whatever they want that we have in season. Um, we do have wireless because there are people who can't be disconnected from the world. And we don't really have cell service. We don't have a TV. Uh, so we also have outside games that people can play, but mostly we have a creek and we have woods. And so you'll find that everybody plays in the creek and woods more than they play badminton. So we're here to talk though about hospitality, not farming. Um, and I divide hospitality into three pieces, things you need to know, things you need to do. So I divide it into presentation for best practices, uh, you're online and on your farm, amenities, things that you offer, and how to manage and exceed guest expectations. So we'll start off presentation, presentation, presentation. That's actually a retail term as well, but it works very well on the farm. And where's the first place that you're presenting? Well, you're probably presenting online. Uh, you're next presenting at your farm entrance, and then next you're presenting with your welcome. So for your website, and if you only use something like an OTA, Airbnb, this would still be true. You want to make sure that you're easy to find, that you're easy to contact, it doesn't work as well with the OTAs, works well on your website, um, and that you're easy to book if you're doing lodging. So this is our website, and this shows a few other things that we let people know about when they get onto our site. Um, activities that we might have on and off the farm, if they want to buy lamb from us direct, um, where we show up in the news, we have a shop, things like that. And then this is, we use a booking software called ResNexus. So people can come right in, they can see what dates are available, they can book online. Now, when we first started out, I just did emails back and forth to people and kept my own calendar. And I had a huge fear of double booking, which would be horrible. And I never did that. But when I switched to this, all of a sudden people were making reservations at midnight my time or at 5 a.m. my time, and I didn't have to worry about it. It was just said and done. So the next uh, presentation is at your farm entrance. And you know, a lot of us go in and out of our farms so much, we don't actually see them anymore. 
So I always try to get out to the front entrance and look at it. What would I see if I were a guest coming in for the first time? Would I be scared? Would I think, oh no, I don't wanna turn down that driveway. So you wanna make sure things are as neat as possible that your sign is well painted. It doesn't look as if you're going out of business. And then you also want to welcome your guests. And I know with COVID and there was this whole contact list, whatever, we never did that um, because we are a farm. And I do think it's really important uh, to greet people, um, even if you're standing 10 feet away. And um, part of what we do is we take people on a farm tour and I call it a danger tour. And I kind of laugh, ha ha ha. I actually really mean it. It's a danger tour. We have a creek, we have a hayloft, we have animals. I want to make sure that parents know what's dangerous. I want to make sure they know their kids aren't supposed to jump on the tractor um, and or go in with the rams. And I think when you do that, you know, you kind of set expectations right up front. So you're not gonna have people think they're gonna ride the horse. You know, they get to pet the horse on the other side of the fence. Um, but what it does is it really helps guests relax because most of our guests are urbanites and they don't know, they don't know. And I've discovered that accidents happen in the first 30 minutes. Somebody's gonna trip and fall or do something. It's in the first 30 minutes. So if I can give them that danger tour first, we're kind of covered. In terms of amenities, you know, this is going to be different depending on the size of your operation. What are you, are you just doing tents? Are you doing platform glamping tents? Are you doing um, cottages or tiny houses? But the basics are still kind of the same. So you want to make sure that you have clean, clutter-free, whatever it is, because it allows people to think, okay, I can be in here. I can put my stuff in here. They can see it better and it's not so hard to clean. Um, I also say good bedding because if guests sleep well, they're happy guests. If they don't sleep well, there can be a little grouchy in the morning and there's other things to make them grouchy like the peacock yelling at four in the morning. So oh, I wanna make sure they have good pillows, they have good mattresses, they have good sheets. Bathrooms, you know, this is where you gotta be hotel style or as clean as you can if you're using composting or outdoor bathrooms, but they need to be clean. Um, that's that's just my number one rule. And then there are some extra things you can do. So luggage racks, you know, if you use luggage racks and you offer them, people won't put their suitcases on your really nice bedding and then it won't get dirty. Uh, we have a welcome sign that we just hand write a welcome in the house. And then I love fresh flowers. And so, and if it's not flowers, it's not time of year, I'll cut some other greenery and put it in the, in the farmhouse. Boots. So we do provide boots. We are in Oregon, it can be muddy. So um, this is something that a lot of guests will just leave. And then the next time they come the next year, then they've got the next size up if they have multiple kids. So, and we give them our old boots too. So I always tell people, well, they might have holes in them, but they'll still keep most of the mud out. Um, we do have a welcome, we used to have a, well, we have a welcome book that we put in the cottage in the farmhouse, but we also use this new online welcome book. Um, this one is through Touch Day. We can put everything in it and we email it to our guests as soon as they make a reservation because it has everything from how do we handle safety to directions to things to do in the area. You can add whatever you want into it. And a lot of people access it. They can download it. It's an app and they can bring it with. But I, having that kind of information for people just solves a lot of questioning about what, what the expectations will be. And then managing and exceeding expectations. So I always say, you know, you're on a farm, so you've already exceeded their expectations as soon as they kind of walk on. Um, but, you know, there's more you can do um, because there are some concerns. It's gonna be boring, it's gonna be dirty, and we're gonna make you work and you're paying us this money to stay. So I try to make sure we get through all of that. If you want to come for chores, great. If you don't want to come for chores, it's absolutely fine. Um, and then that lack of connection, some people want to be totally disconnected. <clears throat> some people are terrified. They're also terrified of the dark. I do make sure that they know we're on a dead end road. And yes, it is very dark, but they can turn the lights on. It should be fine. We're all fine. Um, so we do talk about safety you know, as well. Those are things that just those are their concerns. So we try to allay all of that. Um, and then we do handle problems immediately. I did put my dog in this picture. I don't actually have my dog around guests anymore because as much as 
Uh, people will listen to what you have to say. I don't find that people greet dogs the right way. They all have family dogs and it's really dangerous where they greet with face in first. And so I just keep my dogs away. But we do have those conversations if I did have a dog on property. Um, and I also like to just treat guests the way I would like to be treated. If, you know, if they see spiders that are in the ceiling, I have to explain, well, we just dusted them away five minutes ago. It'll be okay, they don't bite. it. Um, then there's all the little things you can do. Um, you know, take that iconic family photograph. And if you can figure out how to do it in front of the name of your farm, that's even better. Because uh, a lot of times they show up as um, the Christmas card. Um, share recipes. You know, we sell lamb right on property. We have a sheet with recipes right next to it that we can hand out because for lamb, a lot of people don't know how to cook lamb. Um, classes, we don't do classes. You could do classes, hands-on opportunities. That little girl there holding that bottle. So feeding a baby lamb a bottle. I have to explain some years we don't have bottle lamps and I explain why we don't and how happy I am that we don't because how, of how expensive it is. But um, we do have goats. We do let people hold our goats. We do let people hold our lambs. We do have a donkey you can brush. So there's a lot of hands-on stuff. You can play in the creek. Um, you can feed the animals with me. Um, and then we have friendly staff and I wanna make sure that everybody feels welcomed and that they can ask us any question and that no question is a stupid question. We do have a few extra things we do. So we have ferry houses in our woods. If you've ever been in the coast range of Oregon, it's very, and Merlin-esque. And so we, there's a fairy house right there in the base of one of our trees. Um, and I also write hand thank you notes to everybody, whether they're repeat guests or not. What makes guests come back? You know, they had a good time. They had fun. Um, we exceeded, it was better than they thought it was going to be, which is the thing I hear the most. And then I kind of wonder, oh, really? What did you expect? But okay. Um, they get to relax uh, and they were welcomed and they were thanked. Um, and why does that matter for us? And this is gonna, this first slide is gonna be a little bit Carla's slide as well, um, because we get our chance to educate our urban neighbors. And so our guests get a much better indication of um, how hard, you know, the comment I get is, you know, I didn't realize farming was so hard. And so then when they go home and they see those prices in the farmer's market, because we also let them graze, as I mentioned in our property, and so they get to eat really fresh food. They don't mind paying that higher price. They understand why there's a higher price. Um, we also, okay, um, we get a chance to offer rural, good old rural hospitality. You know, there's a huge urban rural divide. And I think if we can do anything to help put, make that better, then, then that, that works for all of us, especially these days. A chance to get some assistance with chores if you're lucky. So this mom suggested to her three boys that they might want to help me uh, broom out my barn. That little one on the right was the one that helped me. The other two went upstairs in the hayloft and played basketball. But then they all came down and wanted to make sure I took a photograph to show their mom that they'd all helped. <laughs> yeah. um, and a chance to config, uh, to handle the confusion with chickens and eggs. I mean, that's the first question I get. If I crack this egg, is a chick gonna fall into the frying pan? And I'm thinking, oh my God, if that ever happened to me, I would never eat eggs again. So we have to have the whole story about how do you get chicks and eggs and things like that? Cause we do have a rooster and then we have to have that conversation as well. <laughs> and then this is the best one for me or for us as farmers, we get to see our farm through other people's eyes because all I see when I look at my farms, oh, that fence needs to be fixed and the sheep got out there. And this way we get to see what they see. And so I think that's really important for us just to feel like our hard work is going somewhere. You know, what if your farm isn't like mine? So I'm giving examples of other, uh, you know, trailers or shepherd's wagons or inns or ranches. You know, it doesn't really matter. Hospitality is the same in all of our farms and ranches. You know, it needs to be that five-star experience. Um, and, Okay, this is, I have to do this fast because um, I would be negligent if I didn't mention that I run Farm State USA. So this is a site for working farms and ranches. That's where that comes in that offer lodging. And we provide services and marketing and help and assistance and mentoring for farms. And if you see right here, this is some of our resources. And one of those has to do with hospitality. Another has to do with reservations. Uh, we're more than happy to to help people start up because we think that we're also speaking from a place where we have some knowledge. Um, and in the end, you're already a rock star. 
um, on your farm. So it's like, why not try the hospitality part of it? So thank you very much. I guess I should say other questions. Yes. Um, one, sorry, one question that I haven't, or kind of challenge I've encountered in the providing hospitality on a farm or homestead that I haven't been able to crack is guest waste production. Um, like you said, most people are coming from the cities. They don't understand or trust well water. They're bringing in cases of bottles of water. Uh, we compost on site. I'm asking them to collect compost and no matter what I give them for instructions, it's there's a plastic still ends up in the compost somehow. And so I've been picking it out by hand. How have you encountered this, like any massive waste production with your guests and how do you handle that? So I'm gonna go to compost first. We have a compost uh, lesson at the very beginning. What can go in the compost? What can go in the chicken yard? What can't go in the chicken yard? And we put compost, bins right there in our kitchens or right outside the door so that people can fill those. And then that doesn't seem to be a problem. In terms of bottled water, ah, we have a spring and it's the most fabulous water you could ever imagine. And so you're right. I don't think that I do as good a job as I should about letting people know our water is fine. You can drink out of the tap. You can drink our well water. I don't know how to stop people from bringing bottled water, but it's a, it's a really good point. We do recycle. And so we show everybody where we recycle. So we say, this is where the recycle goes. And then I also mentioned, cause in Oregon, we get 10 cents back for every bottle. So I'm like, don't throw that out. The, you know, we'll take the money. If you don't want to recycle it, we'll do that. And so people seem pretty okay with leaving all of their money on the floor for us. But that's a, that's a good point. I don't know what to do about bottled water. I think we have to move on to the next okay. speaker, yeah. I'm yeah. afraid. Alrighty, it's my first time using the clicker, so please bear with me. <laughs> Hi there. My name is Cassandra Pren Vasilikas. I'm a government and community relations manager at a company called Hip Camp. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you today about camping as agritourism. So over the next 15 or so minutes, we're going to talk about why camping, uh, the benefits of low impact accommodations on agricultural land. I'm going to share a little bit about Hip Camp to give you some context for our conversation. Um, we are partnering with private landowners to open up opportunities for outdoor recreation on their properties. I'm excited to share a few examples of landowners who are currently using camping as a means of diversification on their farms and ranches. And then I want to spend a little bit of time on some of the challenges that agritourism operators encounter when they start to think about hosting campers on their property. Uh, and that certainly includes regulations, uh, which is how I'll end our conversation. So why are we talking about camping at an agritourism conference? Well, camping is an incidental and low impact land use that I believe really has the potential to support and encourage the continuation of farming on agricultural land globally. Small scale camping on agricultural properties advances the economic interests of farmers in a low impact and sustainable way. It's consistent with the primary use of the land, which is agriculture. And it enables farmers to diversify while keeping the vast majority of their land in production. The revenue generated also helps people avoid sale and subdivision, which makes it a powerful tool for farmland preservation as well. A little bit about Hip Camp. We work with private landowners uh, across four countries to create new places to get outside. By empowering landowners to open up their properties, properties really ranging from two acre homesteads to 80,000 acre cattle ranches, uh, we're working with them to create thousands of new destinations, take pressure off of public land, and generate sustainable revenue. 
These destinations really range. Uh, the word camping, we take a broad approach here, as some of you may know. Uh, so it ranges from bring your own tent and RV sites to yurts, camper vans, camps, so the great New England word, um, glamping sites and everything in between. And listing these sites with HipCamp, which is a booking platform, enables landowners to generate sustainable revenue. And we learned that that revenue became critical, especially over the last 18 months, starting in 2020 with wineries unable to host visitors, farms hurt by the closures of restaurants, people with working lands really turned to hip camp to make money. And uh, many of our partners, our landowners, have shared that that became their most reliable source of income over the course of the pandemic, uh, due in no small part to people really craving access to the outdoors, uh, and also due to this trend back to the land, right? People want to connect with their food. During COVID, people learned that they didn't really know where their food came from. They didn't understand the challenges they were encountering at the supermarket. And so we really found that people were turning en masse on the demand side to find places to get outside safely with their loved ones and learn a little bit in the process. And they were turning to uh, hip camp on the landowner side to earn revenue. So first camping um, with the rising costs of land, water, agricultural inputs, um, agricultural communities really need every opportunity to diversify. And we see camping as a big part of that potential. It's already a critical source of revenue for many, as I've shared. And in 2021, landowners who worked with Hip Camp earned over $31 million hosting people on their properties for overnight stays. Um, Two thirds of our hosts shared that they used that money to maintain and keep up their property. And about 40% said that they used it to pay their mortgage or property taxes. So this income is keeping people on their land. Camping doesn't only benefit the people who are hosting folks on their own properties. Campers are spending money locally at cafes, gear stores, farm stands, you name it. Um, generating sustainable revenue for small business owners, other agricultural operators, and really stimulating the local economy with tourism dollars. Campers also buy things from the people they're staying with. We just heard people buy lamb on Scotty's property. They're buying meat, veggies, yarn, milk, you name it, from the folks that they're staying with, often at a much higher cost than a producer would get wholesale and without the landowner having to leave their property to sell that good. I will add that we did an economic impact study for six counties, um, four in California, one in Utah, and one in Colorado to understand the economic impact of this activity. We looked at uh, spender profiles, hip camp data, and data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And if you're interested in some of that work, we worked with Earth Economics uh, to produce that study. And I would, I would love to talk to you about it more. Just don't have time to do that in the next 10 minutes. I'll also share that um, we've learned that camping is a really uh, incredible family-friendly activity. And as we all know, farm stays are directly exposing people, including and especially children, to agricultural lands and lifestyles. Broadening our understanding of agritourism to include camping will make it easier to introduce this next generation of farmers and consumers uh, to working lands. And I'll also add that camping can be a more affordable option, right? So it makes access to these properties um, more, like casts a wider net in terms of access. I wanna share a bit now about some of the folks that we work with who are using camping to diversify revenue. And we're gonna talk specifically about landowners in Maryland, Ohio, North Carolina, and California. But we do partner with landowners across more than 2,500 counties and in all 50 states. The Willett Family Farm, this is a farm in Maryland. Jeremy hosts one campsite and sells on-site goods and produce on his 13 acre farm. This land has been in Jeremy's family for generations before it was sold in 2006. And Jeremy and his wife, Kathleen, actually purchased it back in 2017. And since then have welcomed hundreds of guests from around the country and the world. The Willets produce veggies, farm, beef, eggs, and more. And hosting campers has really given them an opportunity to sell products directly to their guests. He, um, Jeremy actually shared recently that their on-site sales, the data from their on-site sales enabled them to receive a $50,000 grant from the US Department of Agriculture to hire their first employee on the farm uh, and to invest in their organic egg business. And so hosting campers is actually increasing the amount of agricultural production that they're able to do on the property. Uh, they also made more in the last year from those on-site sales than they did from hosting campers. So it's really been uh, incredibly successful for them here. Um, George and Carol host 15 sites, so a bit of a larger operation. 
on an 115 acre Christmas tree farm in Ohio. It's a Christmas tree farm, so it has a longer off season than most other agricultural operators. And this is just one way that they diversify during the other 11 months and two weeks of the year. Um, and I really love this quote from George just about how camping is just one part of how they've kept this property in their family. Smoky Mountain Mangalista Farm is in North Carolina and Rick and Catherine host 12 sites on 95 acres. They uh, bought this property, it was originally a dairy farm and it was slated for urban development before they bought it in 2017. Um, when COVID hit in 2020, the restaurants that they had agreements with to buy their, their meat uh, disappeared and they were stuck with pigs that needed to be fed at least two times a day. Um, tourism really saved the day for them and camping now accounts for 75% of their farm's revenue. Uh, and there's an educational piece here as well, right? 100% of the earnings that they're making hosting campers are going into feeding these pigs that campers then see when they come to the farm. Kenny hosts a ranch in California in the heart of Paso Robles wine country, but growing grapes is not an option for him on his property. Water restrictions really prevent him from increasing irrigation. So he has 850 acres of cattle, grain, and open space. About five years ago, Kenny put campsites on his ranch. These are glamp sites, as you can see from this beautiful picture. And over the past few years, those sites have become essential and they've enabled him and his family to stay on this property in an area where the cost of land is growing at an unbelievable rate uh, as is most property in California, so you may be familiar. As we've heard from a lot of folks this week, there are challenges uh, present when it comes to deciding whether or not to have an agritourism operation on your property. There's a lot to think about. Everything from amenities, um, what kind of restroom are you gonna have? Are you gonna have parking? Are you gonna clear sites? Are you gonna have signage, right? All of these things you need to think about before you welcome folks to your property. Um, neighbor relations, do you have a shared road? Is there gonna be increased traffic? Can somebody see or hear what's happening on your property? You know, you wanna make yourself open to a conversation, open to feedback and make sure that you're communicating transparently with the folks around you. And then uh, liability and guest safety has also been a big topic uh, over the last few days. I'm not an expert on liability, but I think there have been some folks who've shared some really incredible information uh, about liability protections for agritourism operators. And I think liability is an important reason why I want to talk a little bit about regulations uh, and permitting as well, because what is considered an agritourism activity is going to impact whether or not you're protected uh, from a liability standpoint, and also what you need to invest in your property before you get started. So I'll talk just a little bit more here at the end about the need for a more standardized and also more holistic approach to understanding and regulating agritourism. So as many of the folks in this room already know, there is no standard definition for agritourism. There's no list of agritourism activities that everybody everywhere agrees on. And the regulations that apply to agritourism activities uh, is gonna depend not only on the country you live in, the state you live in, the county you live in, but also the municipality, the township, uh, really every level of government that you can imagine, they're all gonna have their own set of requirements and regulations. In the words of Kenny from California, it was easier to build my house than to put a tent site on my property. And we hear that all the time. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long process. Um, we're seeing a regulatory shift though, when it comes to understanding that agritourism activities can support and encourage uh, the continuation of, of production on agricultural land. So I wanna share today three examples of new and evolving uh, conversations around agritourism regulations at the state and county level. So we'll talk first about Maryland. So this is a recent change in May of 2022. So this year, the definition of agritourism in Maryland was amended to include camping and what the state is calling incidental outdoor stays. Uh, so that's a pretty wide umbrella, but it includes everything from a yurt to a glamp site to uh, maybe a cabin that wouldn't qualify as a traditional vacation rental, for example. Um, this is opening up critical opportunities to Maryland farmers and it is enabling legislation. So local jurisdictions will need to adopt this updated definition and then set their own standards, which is often the case for statewide regulation. Uh, this change is really modernizing the state's approach to agritourism and it actually empowered Jeremy Willett of Willett Family Farms to go to his board of supervisors and they've adopted this definition at the county level there as well. Uh, the statewide definition goes into effect this October and was signed into law by Governor Hogan in May. 
In Santa Barbara County, they're working on what they're calling an agricultural enterprise ordinance that would allow certain incidental and compatible uses like small scale camping on agricultural lands across the county. Um, these uses are gonna range from you know, your, your accommodations like farm stays and camping to farm to table meals, horseback riding, cooking classes, tours. Um, they're really taking a, a wide tent approach here and it's gonna be really exciting to see uh, how, this how this legislation comes to fruition. It's been a long process, started in 2017, I believe, um, but getting closer every day. And in Chafee County, Colorado, they're working on amendments to their land use code that would also make their definition for agritourism more specific and inclusive. Um, the activities currently listed in their draft language, they did just release that draft, I believe last month, uh, include on-site hospitality services like bed and breakfast and camping, uh, as well as educational programming. So again, another exciting step forward when it comes to thinking about camping and different types of accommodations as agritourism. I think this process is really exciting. Uh, there's obviously a lot of work still to be done. Few places have comprehensive definitions for agritourism, even fewer consider camping as an agritourism activity. Um, and that can really leave agricultural operators who are looking for ways to diversify in a gray area and relying on individual staff or on individual neighbors to be kind of on board with their activities, right? We want there to be regulatory certainty for folks so that when you invest in your property, in your business and welcoming folks to your land, you have confidence that you'll be able to continue doing that activity. At Hip Camp, we've really learned over the past few years how impactful even one campsite can be in terms of revenue for an agricultural operation. And while we all understand that agritourism is an important way for farms to stay economically viable, I don't know that camping has really been a central part of that conversation yet. And so we're really excited and grateful to be here meeting with all of you and learning about the incredible things that folks are doing in the agritourism space. We're really excited to continue working with landowner, our landowner community and with partners across the country to lower the barrier to entry for folks who are interested in hosting campers on their property. Uh, and we really believe that you know, really clear regulations are gonna be one important way to do that. So thank you all for listening <laughs> to me for the last 15 minutes and welcome any questions you may have. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to ask, uh, I have a couple questions online and then I'll, I'll get to your question. Um, Tamikia wants to know um, how to mitigate dangers of open fire use in basic camping. And Nikki echoed that question asking generally what farmers need to do to protect their land and themselves when welcoming campers. Yeah, great question. So I think fire safety is its own category, actually. Um, we're a California-based company. Fire safety is top of mind for us at all times. And we believe that education is going to be the best tool that we have, not just on private land, but more generally, right? Folks who are going to camp on farms are and learn about fire safety on farms can then bring that information with them when they go to a property like Bureau of Land Management property or Forest Service land where there isn't a host there to share with them the importance of fire safety, safety in general on their properties. Uh, and so we have tools within our platform that we use to educate folks about fire safety. We have a fire ban tool. So if you're a landowner and you are on a property in a place with a fire ban, or you've just decided for yourself that you would prefer not to have open fires on your property, you turn that on through our app and it sends a text and email notification to everybody with an upcoming booking saying, hey, when you booked, fires may have been allowed, they're not anymore, and this is why. Um, and people can also see that on your listing if you have specific rules. Um, we do also take uh, an educational approach here. We host webinars with CAL FIRE uh, and with um, cultural burn experts from across California to really provide resources to host hip campers, anyone else who's interested uh, about the importance of fire as a, a management tool for the land, but then also about how to, as a host, set up everything you may need to provide a safe experience from an emergency response plan to getting in touch with your local fire department to say, I have people on my property, right? So that in the event of a fire, anywhere in your vicinity, they know uh, that there are people there. Um, we have also integrated with the National Weather Service. So if you're a host and you're hosting, you'll get a text saying, hey, you might wanna turn your fire ban on today. Uh, to the question about how to protect your property, I think expectation setting is the most important thing that you can do. It's I think in the similar camp as education, Hosts set all of their own rules on their property. Hip campers have to sign that they agree to adhere to your rules before they come. And we do have a one-strike policy. 
Um, and so we can remove people from our platform who are unable or unwilling to adhere to the rules set by landowners. Um, but everything from signage, this is where you can go, this is where you can't go, um, to providing a guide. Scotty, you mentioned you have like a really robust online resource for folks before they come. I think everything that you can do to share information, have it be downloadable and accessible to folks before they get there, will go a long way towards making sure they behave in the way that you expect them to when they come to your land. Question. Yeah. Uh, can you outline the breakdown of the money people pay to stay and where the costs are allocated and where the revenue goes? Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you for that question. So we are a booking platform, so it's free to sign up on HipCamp, but we do take a percentage of uh, the cost when folks book on our platform. So if you're a landowner and you sign up on HipCamp, you create your online profile, what you charge per night is going to be entirely up to you. And HipCamp does take 10% of that cost. And that 10% goes towards credit card transaction fees. We do provide liability insurance up to a million dollars per occurrence. Uh, and then we are also hosting the booking platform and providing seven day a week support. There is a service fee to the camper that is proportional to the size of their booking as well. And that's a, it's a percentage. And then 90% of what you charge as a landowner will be direct deposited or put into a PayPal account, depending on your preference. Of course, thanks for the question. Thanks, Cassandra, great presentation. I have a question about the, the ordinances that are coming in with agriculture and, and thinking about camping is a little different than overnight stays when you're thinking about taxation and if there are any sort of tax implications for any of those ordinances that are coming to pass. That's a great question, thank you. Uh, so it's really gonna depend on the jurisdiction. Uh, there are some places where camping uh, is a, a, the TOT lodging tax applies to camping the same way it does to a hotel or to a cabin. There are other places where camping isn't put into that category or if you have a structure, you're gonna be taxed differently than if you have a bring your own tent site. So it is really important that folks are doing their research to ensure they're paying the applicable taxes and you can customize which taxes you'll be collecting on each of your, what we call listings through our platform. So if you have, one cabin, one glam site, and one tent site, and you know that the ta each type of accommodation is taxed differently, you can customize that within the platform and that will automatically be added to each booking uh, so that you can then remit that to your jurisdiction. Um, in terms of the ordinances coming out, I think a big motivator is that folks are realizing they can collect taxes off of this, right? And so that is a factor here, right? There are counties who are recognizing that there is money to be made um, from crafting ordinances that are going to make it easier for folks to be permitted and then taxed um, on this land use. And so we, we expect to see that uh, be part and parcel of, of all of these new ordinances. Thank you so much. I'm afraid we have to move to the next one. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Audrey Comerford. I'm with Oregon State University Extension. Um, my colleague here, Melissa, will be speaking the second half of the presentation. Um, but together, we are the Extension Agricultural Tourism Team for Oregon. Um, and uh, this was brought about by needs in our community. Um, they determined that there was enough of these types of agritourism operations to require support. Um, it is not something new in our area. We've had farm stands, you picks, um, harvest festivals, events for many years. Um, but uh, over the course of the last 10 years or so, it's really been looked at at a university level. Um, today, we're going to talk about one of the programs um, we received grant funding for, and that was the online course um, that is open to everyone, but specifically targeting Oregon producers. Um, as we know, agritourism is not for everyone and having a cohesive place where these resources, these decisions can be made, you can apply these ideas to your own operation. Um, that was essential for us. Uh, we would be getting calls and be going through the same spiel about our land use regulations. Um, there are things that have been talked about at this conference that you would never be able to consider in Oregon, and that has to do with our exclusive farm use um, protected land. Um, and those are some challenges we're working through as far as offering agritourism. So um, we determined that uh, a self-paced resource course 
um, was needed. It's a compilation of text, of um, fact sheets, of videos, case studies with agritourism operations in Oregon. Um, and it covers uh, a wide range of uh, different types of operations, some of them as small as a couple acres. And then we um, have ones that are up to a thousand. So um, it's a very diverse state for those of you that aren't familiar. We have um, rules that apply on the east side, as we call it, that do not apply on the west side. And so having these farmers and ranchers um, look at their specific operation in their specific county um, has become really essential. And then, of course, the pieces that we've talked about today. Do you actually want to work with the public? Do you want them on your farmland? Do you want to explain that the thing they're petting is actually not a goat, it's a sheep and why? So it's one of those, um, it's one of those decisions that's very personal to each family and each operation. And so um, this was kind of our motivation behind it. Um, like I mentioned, this was um, grant funded um, and it was the idea that there's only two of us right now, right? There's two extension agents covering an entire state on this topic and not even full time. So how do we go about reaching as many folks as we can? And so we developed this course that was statewide. Um, it covers um, a number of topics, including what does agritourism look like in Oregon? What are the different types of activities? How to incorporate it into your farm business plan, uh, legal and land use, um, risk management, marketing, customer service, and hospitality. And so through a series of modules, as well as a, um, an action plan that these individual farms can then write down and work through, um, you're able to work through a lot of the different topics that we hear about, but maybe don't necessarily all pull together in one um, spot. We also had, for this grant project specifically, um, we decided to do county specific webinars in our state um, with the county planning departments. So in Oregon, we do have state laws um, that have to do with land use, farmland, what you can and cannot do, but it really is up to the individual county. And so what you can do on one county, their neighbor right next door may not be able to do or may not be permitted the same way. Um, it can cause a lot of contention. We do have landowners who are um, nervous about talking to their county planning offices. And so this was a good way for us to be able to bridge that gap and say in a very you know, calm and in COVID way, so we did it over Zoom, um, you know, just this is our questions. How would you go about permitting this? Is this even legal? The folks that were hesitant about asking, Melissa and myself would ask those questions. Uh, nobody was put on the spot, which is very important. Um, we also are still in the process, but have done quite a few um, individual uh, visits out to site visits to the farms. Um, we've done everything from blueberry farms, lavender farms, livestock operations, um, the whole bit. So it runs the gamut. And that way we can take a look at their individual action plan. Maybe they have questions on a certain module in the course that we would like, they wanted us to go more in depth in um, and kind of how it applies to their physical space. So this is just um, briefly the state of Oregon for those we're on the West Coast, we're above California for those that don't know. Um, that's usually everyone says, oh, I love California. <laughs> Up. Um, we have 36 counties um, and we had participants from om almost all of them. This course has been open since March. Um, we do plan to keep it with some updates um, as part of our normal programming. Um, you can see the darker counties. Those are the counties Melissa and I serve specifically. We are county funded. Um, and so the outreach there was stellar. Um, but we have, if anybody's familiar with Oregon, that east side or to the right, um, large cattle ranching desert. And we have one, this is our county over here, way in the corner, uh, a large 100 plus acre cattle ranch operation is interested in ag adding agritourism and took this course. So when we get the comment of, oh, it's really for small farms, I like to throw that example at them. Can you clarify, you said 100 plus acre. Mm -hmm. 100 plus? Yeah, large acres. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the west side, we're looking at farms that could be an acre 
Um, it could be um, 10 acres. A lot of them are in that five to 20 range. And I actually got a slide here in a minute um, that will show kind of the breakdown. We asked them kind of what size, because we are trying to gauge information on these agritourism operations as well. Not a lot of studies have been done specifically um, about you know what it looks like. There was one that was done recently um, that helps us get that first step. But um, yeah, we can hundreds of acres over there. And a lot of it is on um, like federal land and things like that. So um, as far as our course participants, when this was, um, when we gathered the data, are still working on it. Like I said, the course is still open. Um, there was uh, a great range of experience. Some of these farms have been farming for less than five years. Um, some of them have been farming for um, much larger than that. Um, we had a lot of them that have actually been farming for over 20. So that was kind of our idea of, is this something that folks are looking to add as new and beginning farmers or ranchers? Is this something that folks are looking to diversify? Um, and so that was a very interesting statistic for us. Um, and here is, goes up to the number of acres as well. So these are the folks as of this summer that had taken the course and the number of acres they currently are stewards of. Uh, Oregon, very diverse in crops. Um, these are the types of crops um, that was reported as their farm produces. Um, we have everything from food and fiber. We have cut flowers, um, different types of um, vegetable crops, fruit crops, big range. And so when you think about adding agritourism to those, each one of those has different needs and requirements that really need to be met. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn over to Melissa. I think the reason that we're so proud of that um, one ranch over in Eastern Oregon is that it's in a town of like 30 people and there's not much around. There's a lot of scenic beauty, but um, not a lot as far as um, bringing tourism or tourists, tourists to ranches. And we're just so excited that there's one person and she's young and she's a new farmer and she's excited about what she can do to enhance the economic diversity in her area. So our timeline was short. We received this funding in 2021. We um, actually had all of the agreements signed about this time last year. So Audrey and I went to work very quickly to create the curriculum. We already knew what we wanted to do, but to create videos and all of these accessory um, fact sheets and things, we, we moved fast but not fast enough because we really wanted to have this course launched in January of 2022. So just like, what would that be, nine months ago? And we managed to get it done and open to the farmers and ranchers in March. And March starts the busy season for farms. <laughs> and so um, we felt really grateful that we had um, about 140 participants register for the class. We charge $20 for the entire course and they can keep those materials for a year. Um, they can print things out too and keep them forever. So there wasn't a big rush to get it done, except for we wanted to have some data to share with you today. <laughs> so we encouraged some people, um, our participants to kind of hey, if you get this course done, would you please fill out this evaluation form? We wanna share some information. So we are looking forward to the future and having more um, encompassing info. But for now, we've got some good info to um, statistics to share with you. So we did have about a third of the participants complete the course and fill out the evaluation form. Um, as an extension professionals, we love that people really felt they got something out of this. So 73% of those strongly agreed that this course helped them improve their understanding of agritourism. And we call it agricultural tourism over there um, in Oregon and then how it relates to their farm. So we felt really good about that, that we managed to get the right information in that curriculum to start with. So we had, um, over half the participants said they haven't started agritourism yet. So that gave us um, some good information as well, especially in some of the quotes that were um, provided um, through the evaluation process. And one I wanna share with you is, I had been sort of floundering trying to figure out how my agritourism idea could get off the ground. 
and your class was exactly the information I was looking for, which is nice, but then she goes on to say, I know that the information in this class saved me from wasting thousands of dollars and many years of my life on a business plan that would not have worked here. I'm excited about the future now. So I like, I mean, it's not exactly what you want to hear, but it's so valuable, especially for these farmers that are trying this out um, or taking this course from the beginning. They're realizing that, oh, for whatever reason, this might not be for me. So that we felt really actually quite good about that in the long run. Um, so um, as a result of participating in this course, about 30 of those 44 people that finished the course do plan to add an agritourism activity to their farm or ranch. And some of those are um, in the beginning stages, beginning, of far beginning farmers and ranchers and others, as we've mentioned, have quite a lot of an experience and are adding to their business. So as part of the action planning process and this action plan we incorporated into the course, um, we had some specific actions that we were curious if they were going to take. And some examples of those would be like installing a limited liability sign on your farm or um, determining your pro the proper insurance needs you have for the activity that you're doing or um, improving visitor safety by doing a walkthrough on your farm, um, contacting that county planning department, or maybe adding a new marketing strategy. And so we had a whole list of those and 61% of the respondents said they were going to do at least seven of them. So we felt pretty good about that. There was gonna be some action taken, not just um, you know soaking in the learning piece, but actually moving forward. And then we also asked, hey, what was the most useful part? And of course, everyone likes the video case studies, hearing from other farmers, which makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure there was like, scan the text and then get to the video and play it. And then like, maybe <laughs> download that PDF that summarizes that text. So um, yeah, that was all good stuff. So. And then I just wanted to show a couple of these slides that, um, show knowledge gained on different topics. And we had a series of these based on the major topics within the curriculum. And this was just, um, yeah, knowledge of liability risks and how to reduce them before and after the course. So the red is before and the purple blue color is after. So um, this just visually shows that there was quite a significant amount of learning. We haven't run the statistics on these numbers yet, um, but we're, we're excited that um, some people felt that they had a high or advanced level of learning from the materials. And this was another example of a marketing agritourism. How did their knowledge improve or understanding? So it was kind of fun for us to see someone walk in with no experience and then that um, that knowledge level went up. So what's next for our course and um, why are we here? And we, well, we wanna just share with you that um, you know, this online learning is here to stay for sure. And it has been for a while. And I think that this is a, a neat opportunity for um, extension educators and other educators to kind of put everything in one place. We feel that this course, other than the, um, legal and regulate regulatory part, which is specifically Oregon, the content can be used in other places. And we had 14 participants that registered that were um, from out of state or even out of country. And we're seeing some of the benefits they had from just that basic um, kind of baseline informa information. But we know that we need to improve it. So um, we did. We do have suggestions from the participants on how to um, make some of the the curriculum a little more understanding or understandable, including closed captioning on the videos, which was something we didn't even think about. Um, uh, we need to add to our risk management section. We realized that right away. We wanted to include um, biosecurity and then. Um, also a farm evacuation plan process. We do have wildfires in Oregon and being and flooding and other things of so being think, thinking about that. Um, so we'll add those sections. Since people love the videos, we know we need to add more. So we just did some filming in July down in Southern Oregon to look at a multi-generational farm, how agritourism is creating space for the next generation to come back and have a place on the farm. And then also we are talking about on-farm lodging 
And we are grateful for Scotty to be in our state. Scotty um, and I have been working for, I don't even know, 15 years or something, trying to figure out how to get extension involved with agritourism. And so we're glad that we're finally, finally able to produce something that useful. And then we are also planning to um, include networking um, opportunities into the future. So that's what we're um, planning to do. Oops, wrong one. And then um, Audrey's always smart and adding the QR code to things <laughs> that I don't think about. So if you wanna access the course, there's that. If you wanna access the course um, because you're interested in doing something similar and you wanna not pay the $20 registration fee, let us know because we do, um, we offer scholarships to farmers and ranchers as well, but also to our colleagues. So if there's any questions, we'd be happy to, to visit about those. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. And I wondered where your funding came from and how long you've had an agritourism extension component or what area you came from when you got there. Okay, so our funding was from the risk management um, agency. So it's through the Western Center for Risk Management Education. And that funding ends um, at the end of this month. So it was a pretty short program and that's that. And then um, I'm actually a, a small farms extension agent for a three county region in Oregon. And through just landowner connection and the fact that most of the farms I work with do um, direct marketing as their main form of selling product. And the fact that on farm direct marketing as a piece of that, agritourism was just kind of a natural fit. It's, um, it doesn't even count in my FT. I work part-time and I think this might be, I don't know, it's not even, it doesn't even factor in, but it's good work and I'm glad to do it. Um, and there's been partners around the state that have helped with this until um, we got Audrey. <laughs> <laughs> I was hired um, in late 2019, um, and before that, my um, predecessor, Mary Stewart, had been working in this realm as well, but um, Melissa and I are looking forward to expanding this in Oregon. As you all know from this conference, agritourism isn't going anywhere, and we could use all the support we can get, so <laughs> we're looking to grow the program, um, and we'll see where it leads. One more question, maybe? Thank you. Um, I was actually just uh, had an, a logistical question. What platform do you use for the online training program? Because we built one at the Minnesota Department of Health and we know it's out of date now and we're looking into how can we revamp it. I'm just curious if you are happy, what the platform is and if you're happy with it. Mm. So we were able to work with our university. Um, and we use Canvas, which is the platform. I have no idea how Canvas works. <laughs> yeah. there's people at OSU that do so they were able to help take our content and get it into that format and um, because it's self-paced we don't have a lot of interaction with it um, seems to be working fine but we know there will be a cost to add and upgrade things as we go Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Post lunch stretch. Everybody give me a fist pump. Okay. Um, great. My name is Laura Lawfer. I am part of this amazing team uh, that put together these agritourism spotlights. Um, the spotlights, am I, do I have a clicker? Yeah. Um, the spotlights came out of an agritourism curriculum training we did and um, that we uh, uh, have uh -oh. okay so our session objectives for today i want to talk to you about the local food program teams agritourism curriculum um, and then we'll explore the spotlight tours that we created to go with the curriculum 
And, uh, and my colleague, Anne, will be talking about how to create that agritourism spotlight. We both work for North Carolina State University. Um, I'm the project director for Empowering Mountain Food Systems. And I've been working on this curriculum uh, with this local food uh, team for a few years. Okay, sorry. Um, so I am part of the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Local Food Program Team, uh, the Economic Impacts Work Group. A few years ago, uh, North Carolina State Cooperative Extension selected local foods as a flagship program for the university. And so a lot of resources were um, directed towards that. And each program team has uh, some funding to develop some resources to help extension agents increase their local food program outreach. And this is a tool that came out of that team. And you can learn more about our curriculum um, at this QR code and, and you'll get this um, slide deck. All right, so I'll just go straight into the agritourism uh, curriculum. We developed eight specific modules. Um, they are PowerPoint presentation. Uh, this is a picture of our famous rock star, Carla, Carla Barbieri. Dr. Barbieri helped us create this uh, curriculum. She's just entered this room. So um, Carla was uh, part of our team that developed this curriculum. And so we brought in many subject matter experts for each module and videotaped them for agents to go and, uh, and refer to. Um, each uh, module has the PowerPoint, a facilitator's guide, handouts, and the recorded video. Each, so the, the curriculum is targeted towards extension agents. And then extension agents in turn can take it into the community to train farmers in these different agritourism topics. And there are homework assignments that we suggest folks do between each module. So module one, um, of course, is an introduction to agritourism. You define agritourism and assess local agritourism assets in the community. What else is going on? And we give them kind of a guide to how to make that assessment. And so then they'll come back the next week uh, with a report to share with everybody. It's very, we wanted it to be very interactive. And then module tool is, is really interesting. Um, it's a personal assessment for your suitability for agritourism. Do you really want people tromping in your yard? I mean, yesterday I heard about some folks who went to a farm and they're like, their grass wasn't cut. You know, people are opinionated and they might tell you about that. How are you gonna deal with that? And so this, this tool gets at that uh, kind of personality assessment. Um, you set personal goals and determine how agritourism fits in with those goals. And what is the farm suitability? What are your neighbors like? What's the road like? What's parking like? What are local restrictions, if any? So it's a really good interactive tool to help a farmer assess all those things. Uh, developing the business concept. Um, this is really unique element of what we do in that we collaborate with the small business centers at our community colleges. Um, in the past, maybe extension offices had an ag business agent. We no longer have those. And so each community college in North Carolina has a small business center director that can help with these business concepts. But we also have tools um, in the curriculum to help the extension agent make those, um, those plans and the business concept and the elevator speech. And uh, I'm gonna make a recommendation from what I've, something I learned here today about the elevator speech to mention the five senses. What are you gonna smell, hear, taste, see, touch on my farm? That's a great way to create an elevator speech. I'm really excited about that and uh, a mission statement. And again, uh, market research and a customer interest survey. That might be hard to do for your homework assignment in between the next week, um, but we give the folks the tools to, to do that. Uh, sustaining the business. This is the module that I wrote about how to price an agritourism activity. We have the hidden costs, the direct costs, how much is it going to cost to have the, the teenager come and uh, work the little, the little kid petting zoo or the, um, the little, you know, 
do your own little tractor ride? And how much is it going to cost for me to give each child a pumpkin or to give each child an apple and to give each child the book, you know, the Johnny Apple Seed book? So we create that budget um, and a and the start and the startup cost budget. You know, it's very different. We have two budgets. We have one for a brand new project and one for um, a farm that maybe already has assets on site. Um, then the break even analysis, the balance sheet, profit and loss. What's really interested about agritourism is you're adding a new area of income and expenses to your farm. So how do I integrate that into my existing profit and loss statement? It's seasonal, it's different. You might have to fund it from another part of your budget before you start making money. Where do I have that budget in my existing profit and loss? So we talk about all those really specific nitty gritty details that can be really helpful. Module five, identifying agritourism business resources, um, community organizations in North Carolina. We're fortunate we have the North Carolina Agri Anna, the Agritour Agritourism Networking Association. And again, that's something I've heard about a lot this week is that peer to peer learning. This insurance company is great. This signage is great. Oh my gosh, you'd not believe what happened on my farm. You know, somebody touched the fence, you know? So you have those, those um, conversations. Um, and also uh, we talk about identifying sources of funding, grants, loans. Um, do I wanna get, you know, private equity? Do I wanna get, do a GoFundMe? How do those things work? So we talk a lot about that. And then the last, oh no, we have eight. Um, then marketing, um, the advantages of online marketing, directories, websites, social media, online marketplaces, those things change constantly. And so the extension agent um, can, you know, give folks updates about what's happening in the region. And also, again, this is a, a collaborative teaching opportunity. So farmers are telling farmers what's happening in their community. And discovering the value of customer feedback. How do I evaluate my visitors? You know, do folks, will folks really do an evaluation before they leave? Do I send them an email? Do I offer them a discount next time? But customer feedback is really important. Um, and of course, we, you know, we've heard about, you know, the Yelp, uh, positive and negative uh, Yelp comments you can always get. Uh, module seven. And so, as I had mentioned at the beginning, we have subject matter experts that come and teach. And so, fortunately, we have uh, Professor Robert Brannon, who is an attorney um, that teaches this for us. And that's the, and that when we evaluated the training to extension agents, that's what agents said they were most concerned about. I don't want to give anybody wrong information about liability please don't ask me to do that. And so we recommend that, you know, they get that subject matter expert to give folks um, that best advice. So, um, you know, that, and then again, that's just the biggest issue that, um, that extension hears from farmers about that they're concerned about. So we wanna be spot on about that. And then the last piece is uh, the lean business model canvas. Uh, Becky Bowen, um, our colleague on this project, um, helps folks identify the components of a business plan and to start to prepare a business plan. Um, a lot of farmers, it's, my, it's a bit of a stereotype, but maybe don't go into farming with the business plan. And we want folks to really think about, again, the costs and the risks and the benefits to um, adding agritourism. So I think that is the end of my part before I introduce Anne, but we have developed a planning guide to work with small business centers at community colleges. Can I get a show of hand? Does anybody work with their small business centers? Is that something you're familiar with in your community? Because so other states have them. I know California has a robust small business center. So if you don't collaborate with them, I encourage you to do so. And we can share this guide with how to do that. Okay, and I'm gonna hand it over to Ann. Thank you, Laura. I'm Ann Savage. I'm a tourism extension associate at North Carolina State University. Um, so I was lucky enough to come into this project after they already did all the work with the robust curriculum. Um, and they were thinking kind of similarly to Oregon that we need some of these peer to peer learning opportunities. We can give this curriculum all we want, but if farmers don't see other farmers 
farmers doing it, then are they really absorbing what we're saying? So that's where we came up with these agritourism spotlights. And so our working group each kind of got together and collectively, if you're unfamiliar with North Carolina, we're a pretty varied state with climate and uh, topography. So we have mountains on one side and oceans on the other and sand hills and clay in the middle. So we have a variety of products that are offered. And so we wanted to make sure that we were highlighting different farms and opportunities so that our variety of farms that were thinking about agritourism could see that. Um, so we have 13 developed so far. And so if you go in the Whova app, there's a prezi.com for our poster presentations. You can click on it. It's interactive. These uh, rectangular buttons will take you to each of those spotlights. We also have printout spotlights here, trifolds. Please take as many as you want. I do not want to take them home. Um, we're happy to pass them out if there's anything that interests you. We have them right up here. Just come find us afterwards and grab whatever is interesting to you. Um, but here just kind of shows some of the variety. There's livestock, there's cheese, there's Christmas trees, wine, um, even an oyster farm that we have featured here. And so to craft the spotlights, uh, as Laura mentioned, the Economic Impact Work Group has a little bit of a budget as Extension sees that there's value in the local food program. And so we were able to um, get a stipend to offer to farmers to spend an hour to an hour and a half with them to kind of talk through essentially what the agritourism curriculum outlines and get a better understanding for how they came about their business plan. And we'll get more into kind of the interview questions that we went through in a minute. Um, so the fun thing is that most of us were very familiar with the farms that we were talking to. So we had those like set questions, but we also were able to think of some more specific questions to that um, specific farm. So I interviewed the oyster farm. I also work on the North Carolina oyster trail. So I asked more questions about boat regulations and things like that, that, that our oyster farmers might be more interested in knowing. And it's important for us all to have fun when we work and highlight the work our farmers do. Um, you know, they're very proud uh, and we are so supportive and excited that they're um, having people on the farm. So the interview questions really mirror the um, curriculum that we do. How'd you come up with your business concept? Where do you find support? Um, how do you price your activities? Um, what sort of resources you use to identify those pricing? If you don't have a price associated, why not? Like what's the thought process there? Um, what type of marketings do you use? Are you in associations that help, um, help you market further? Um, and then handling risk, obviously that's a huge part, knowing about the liabilities of the different activities that folks are offering the agritourism profitability impact that Laura mentioned, and also how these new activities are impacting their overall farm and the productions that they're having, so that farmers can really start thinking about the trade-offs and, and seeing how that's playing out with their peers. I'm not going to go deep into this, but when we started putting these spotlights together, we got into a deep conversation about photos that we could use for publication. So I just want to say, if you're using photographs um, and you want to know more about photo release, Feel free to talk to me after. <laughs> and so the final steps is our, our team would, would kind of put the narrative together. We have some templates so we can easily plug them in and get them um, up online. And then we would create these trifolds or bifolds. Um, and we're, we've kind of moved to have a form. We're trying to get more counties represented. Obviously, our map is pretty concentrated in the center part of the state. And so we want more counties and county agents to figure out farms there that can serve as models for other farms so that we can kind of expand the reach of the um, spotlights we have. And so using them moving forward, uh, we have a website. I didn't put a QR code on this one. I don't know why. Um, that has all of our spotlights. But again, if you go to the Whova app, we have our poster up there as a Prezi. It's a Prezi website. And you can access all the ones that we currently have there. Um, we use them in all of our agritourism trainings. We've been taking them around the state whenever we do any sort of talks to agritourism farmers or farmers in general so that they can access it. And more recently, we've been focusing on connecting with our county offices across the state to make sure they know they're there, figure out kind of what their needs are within that realm, um, and also working with our tourism development authorities or our destination marketing organizations. I work in all tourism, not just agritourism, so this is something that I like to bring up to them and Chamber of Commerce 
not only so they know they exist, but also so they perhaps understand a little bit more about agritourism. This is part of that advocacy piece as well, where these can kind of fit in. Um, but also for small businesses who might be thinking of diversification, there's some interesting examples that could be utilized here as well. And then moving forward, we, we, when I put this presentation in, we had big ideas of creating a virtual tour with videos and whatnot, but COVID surges and um, changes in personnel have kind of pushed that into a different thing, but also it's a different audience. And so right now we have a peer-to-peer, farmer-to-farmer, county agent-to-farmer, the, the, those higher level folks. And so thinking about changing this from farmer to consumer, we really need to think about how we wanna change that language and what we want that message to be for each of those farms. So that's something we're kind of thinking through now as we look at our plans for next year to see, okay, what can we do with these spotlights to, to still highlight these farms and the work they're doing and maybe use it as an educational piece for consumers in general um, to get a better understanding of what agritourism means on a farm. And so that's it, thank you. Um, I have some questions coming in from online. Uh, Tamikia wants to know, one, when is the next training available in the <laughs> Durham area? Uh, and also can, uh, it sounds, I think you mentioned this, but um, do non-extension e agents teach this curriculum? Like, do you have, do you do any train the trainer uh, with small business center professionals or mentor farmers? For Durham, I'm not sure, but we can ask your county and we'll ask around. I actually don't know of any trainings that are coming up, but if Tamikia will send me an email, we'll follow up and get back to her. And then Laura, I'm gonna let you answer the next part. <laughs> um, we do work really closely with our small business centers. Um, as far as training, you know, I'm, we're absolutely open to sharing this training and we can share this training with y'all, happy to do that. We just wanna make sure that NC State is um, reflected in your slides, but we can share with the small business centers for sure. Any other questions? Um, the, another person wants to know, is the training available online and do you make it available to people outside of North Carolina or the US, the parts that you know would be applicable? You know, we haven't so far, our first our first kind of outreach was to the county agents so that they could get to the farmers in the state. Um, but, but I think that COVID and all of that stuff has kind of made it more obvious. We did have a farmer do a, a training in 2021, 2020, and she did it online and she had farms from, I think outside of the state involved in it. Um, and so we're, we're looking at that. We just, we'll have to find um, the, the, the people that will uh, lead that training and then open it up for others. There's, there's no, we are, they are videotaped. They, we do have videos of the original uh, instructors and we may have videoed the last one that we did in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Right. So we do have a couple of sets. So it, hopefully you have our contact information and can reach out to us about that. Thank you. Everybody's going to be ready to go. Ready to go? Yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Angela Tweedy. I've been working with the University of Vermont Extension. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a tool we developed for selecting farm state listing sites. Um, it's kind of a comparison tool. So this. It points the other way. I thought it was down. <laughs> so this project um, I've been working on with Lisa Chase and then Scotty Jones as well provided a lot of valuable information as we developed it. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge Tara from Dig in Vermont. For those of you here in Vermont that know her, she had a lot of great advice as well as Stuart Farnham from here at a local insurance agency that helped me because insurance language, as most of you know, is very difficult to understand. So um, 
So we heard earlier, there's a lot of definitions out there for agritourism. And I just wanted everyone to know that this is the one that I'm kind of basing a lot off when I'm talking about agritourism here um, for this tool. This was developed by uh, Lisa Chase, Mary Stewart, and several others. And what I like about this is it takes these on-farm experiences. So it includes education, hospitality, recreation, um, entertainment, and then product sales. And then it's further classified into core activities and peripheral activities. So it can either be the core activities or your on-farm experiences directly directly related to agriculture or your peripheral activities, which are either off farm or not closely related to ag. Um, and then the agritourism activities can include ranches, vineyards, aquacultures, it's a very wide array. Um, so when we think about vacationing, there's many key reasons people give for vacations, but I just wanna to touch on a few of them up here. Um, they talk about wanting to build and strengthen the re these relationships, uh, to rest and relax, improve health and well-being, have an adventure to escape, and just to gain knowledge. And so I like looking at this wheel that was developed, because when you look at that, you can see the reasons people give for vacationing. A lot of those can be solved with agritourism. Um, I also like this for beginning for farmers wanting to get into agritourism on their farms. It's a great way to look at this tool and then to realize, oh wait, I have some ideas that fit in here that may work when you're starting to make some plans. Um, so, so as far as farmers, some benefits for um, farm stays. Um, it's a way to diversify income, but it also allows family members to get hands-on experience and to find jobs on the farm. I actually had a farmer here in Vermont come up and said the whole reason she's wanting to get into farm stays is her kids are in college, one's um, studying marketing, and they, she wants to have a job for them when they come back to the farm and make them feel, because they don't want to be, they don't want to get into farming, but they could have a time marketing or hospitality and things like that. Um, it also breaks up that rural isolation. So you have people come to you and you get visitors out on your farm. So you don't feel like you have to go somewhere just to be around people. Um, connections within the community. So bringing schools out, um, having, I used to be a server, for example, and one farm would bring all of the servers at the restaurants they supplied out to learn from their farm. And we'd have a camping trip. And I was more likely when I walked up to tables to talk to people about the ingredients in there and to mention their farm's name. Um, it creates consumer awareness as well. So when you think about developing a farm stay, um, one of the Five of the things you really wanna focus on are these key aspects, um, creating an enjoyable experience for your guest, managing your own time and resources. So we were just talking about, do you really want people out on your farm? You wanna make sure you don't make yourself too busy. Um, administrating, administering the daily operations, marketing and community relations. And you wanna consider each of these aspects, not only from your experience, but also from your guests experience. And of course, as you go um, get that far and you've considered these, you wanna then test it out. You don't just wanna post up and say, okay, I have this farm stay, invite friends and family, have them give you honest feedback. Do you have enough towels? Um, what else did you forget to pr provide? Did you provide the composting information? Um, whoops, pressing buttons when I'm not supposed to. As I go through most of this. Um, so to help with one piece of this, the marketing, we developed a comparison tool here at uh, University of Vermont Extension. And in this comparison tool, we break it down to several, we compare listing sites and we break it down to several categories. So the first category um, I wanna talk about are the general listing sites. So this is gonna be VRBO, um, Airbnb. And then I did put booking.com here, but since this is an international audience, I do want to point out that booking.com does have a specific agritourism website. Um, in some countries, it has not taken off here in the US at all, but in some countries, they will break out the agritourism part of their booking.com listings and move them over. Um, so these sites, they tend to have higher traffic. Uh, a lot more people think of these. It's the first thing they think when they think of vacation. They also attract visitors from all backgrounds. So you might be getting visitors who come to your farm that may not be wanting that hands-on experience. They might just want to escape and they picked your place because it's out in the middle of nowhere, it's quiet, or it's just easy to get to on their way from somewhere else. 
Um, but you, you might also find people who are interested in that, that hands-on experience and to be a little bit more interactive. Um, these often require more amenities. And if they don't require them, the people that tend to book with you may expect more amenities because they've booked other places. So they have higher expectations of what you provide. So the next one we went to is the more niche listing sites. So these listing sites, which I love that I kind of followed both Scotty and Hip Camp here. Um, these, these include uh, Dirt, Farmstay USA, Hip Camp, Glamping Hub, and Tenter. Um, these are not as widely known to many travelers, but that's also why the travelers that use these sites might be more willing to do hands-on experiences. They might want to get, they might want to go pet the animals or feed, feed people work on your farm. Um, they, they're looking for more of the connection to the outdoors. So these might be the people that are okay with just having a tent. If you provide them with a space, they, they want to bring their tent and camp and just be out in the open. Um, many of these will require a little bit few, fewer amenities to list. And if they're not requiring those fewer amenities, people may not expect as much. Um, for example, there's one site that just requires that you offer parking within so many yards of where the campsite is. Um, so these are things to pay attention to when you go to list with these sites and what it is you can offer. And the last one I want to talk about are the travel subscription sites. So these are, har this is like Harvest Host and Boondockers Welcome. These ones, um, they tend to offer a free subscription in exchange for you offering people to stay on your farm. Um, they attract travelers more looking for overnight stays, kind of shorter stays or bringing their, R maybe having RV hookups or you don't necessarily have to have a hookup, but a place for them to park. Um, they do encourage guests to support the farm by purchasing a product while there, but it's not necessarily a requirement. Um, one thing about these sites is it might be something you could use to test it out, or if you're a traveler yourself, it could be one to list on. So I just wanna show you a little overview. At the bottom we have, uh, I believe this might be Airbnb looking from it, um, but this is kind of how we set our tool up. So it identifies the fee structures listed on the sites, um, the site hosting requirements. So it's just a few bullet points of some things to think about if you want to host with that site. Insurance availability that's offered through the site, um, the support that's offered, as well as some extras some of the sites offer. Like for example, some of them offer, if it's available in your area, a photographer to come take pictures of your campsite for listings. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is Airbnb because they do allow you to list your experiences, which is something else I would like to touch on. Um, here, I took a screenshot, Airbnb and let's see, Hip Camp also allow you to offer some extras. And so even if you're not, ready to do farm stays, or maybe you're already doing a farm stay, but you realize maple season comes and I can handle more people that day on my farm to go take this tour. This will allow you to list your tours and different things like that separately. So maybe you want somebody to come and do a farm tour, but you don't want them to spend the night. This will let you list that. Um, there's also, I know one farmer here, they have farm stays, but then he lists a kayaking experience and he'll take them out kayaking on the river nearby because he has access as a drop-in point and a takeoff point. And so he'll list those separate on the Airbnb and direct his guests towards that. Um, something that has been mentioned, uh, Scotty mentioned this in her presentation, but if you are going to list on multiple sites, which can be recommended to keep your calendar full at first as you're picking up, um, you wanna make sure that those multiple platforms do calendar syncing. So for example here, um, if you take, you list on VRBO and their calendar does sync, sync with your hip camp listing. So if somebody books on hip camp, your VRBO calendar updates, you wanna make sure it does the same the other way as well. Um, some ways to get around this is you can either keep a paper calendar yourself and turn off automatic booking or, or automatic approval or you can uh, manage a different outside calendar syncing program, which I, I won't get too far into because there, there's a lot that goes on there. Some other considerations when you're considering listing your farm stays and developing these, um, taxes. You wanna think about the taxes because some of these sites will go ahead and calculate your federal, state, and local taxes for you. 
Whereas other sites, you have to put them in yourself. And even if they do put them in, they may not take them out and pay them for you. They might put them in a separate account or just give you a list of this is the money that was taken out for your taxes. So you want to be very conscious that you're either putting those aside or it's being taken care of as your sites are being booked. Um, insurance. So while many of these sites do offer liability insurance, it's highly recommended that you do get outside um, insurance because it only covers certain parts of your farm, especially if you're going to have people interacting with the animals or being hands-on. Um, you wanna look into outside policies to cover each of these activities because there are, there are multiple activities you can have on your farm. You might have to have a policy for each one. Um, another thing that we kind of touched on that a lot of people struggle to navigate is local laws. So it might be easy for you to sign up on this site, but you have to really pay attention to what does your local, local laws allow. For example, there's one place here in Vermont, they can set up their yurt, but the moment they put a floor underneath their yurt, it becomes a completely different situation. <laughs> so make sure you're looking into that as you're developing these. And that actually leads me into some of the tools that we've developed here at University of Vermont Extension. Um, you can see on here, I created a couple shortener links for our listing comparison table. Uh, that table will be updated. We have a couple changes as far as insurance language, and we have a site we're going to take down off there. Um, there's some really great how-to guides here on the University of Vermont Extension agritourism page. Um, also, the Vermont um, navigation tool. It helps you navigate, if you're a Vermont farmer, navigate through many of those regulations we were just talking about on the state level. There is a poster, oops, there's a poster out there, uh, Amelia Luke presented yesterday, but I highly recommend checking that out. The way she has it designed allows you to click through and decide what, what uh, operation you're going to be having on your farm, whether it's a farm stay, a wedding, food trucks, and things like that. And you can click through each thing you want to consider and the organization here to talk to in Vermont. And thank you so much. Uh, feel free to email me with further questions. I'm happy to take questions today. Hey, thank you so much. That was amazing. I was um, telling one of my glamping clients. I'm like, I've got this great presentation for you. Um, so the resources you have, do you think they're Vermont specific or you, will they apply nationwide or globally? So as far as the uh, comparison tool, it can definitely be used nationwide and globally. We tried to keep it as general as possible. So it's more about the sites and not so much about how that applies to Vermont farm stays. Um, as the navigation tool, does it go the other way? It doesn't, just down advances it. Okay. Um, the, the Vermont agritourism navigation tool, that is very Vermont specific, but I would recommend people checking that out, especially if you're an extension professional in another state, because I think that's a great way to model. The way Amelia divided that up is a great way to model in other states to help uh, farmers and ranchers navigate the different state laws and it, I would love it if you could get it locally, but you know how those change constantly. <laughs> okay, so we got to meet uh, Hip Camp and Farm Stay. I'm not familiar with all those other options. Is there anything anyone could say about them? Um, Farm Stay USA, you said you did meet Farm Stay, right? Okay. Farm Stay USA is a really great tool. Um, I will say, I know Scotty got to plug a little bit, but there are some, if you're a member, there are some really great tools on how to market yourself and some things to think about when you're listing your farm stays. Um, Jen, I think you've worked with a couple of them, right? Tenter, I was going to say. Um, Tenter is one, that's the one that helps you set up your own, your own site in some ways. So Tenter, it's smaller and has been up and coming and it can be a process helping set up a site, but they will provide you with 
I believe, did they provide you with the year? You didn't go that route because there's two options with that. <laughs> I can give a little bit of an update because we, we do a yurt through Airbnb and we do a tenter signature campsite, um, which is a package that you actually buy from them that um, has all of the materials to build a platform, has their standard canvas tent and a standard site setup. Um, and it was a little rough. I ended up, it's supposed to be turnkey and I ended up building the platform myself. So, but it's now, um, that is now up and running and it is a very different experience than our yurt side. So we're learning a lot about how the same farm doing basically the same thing can have a very different experience with different models. <laughs> so learning a lot. And I have heard from a, a local farmer who's used Boondockers Welcome and he did mention it brought people to his farm, but not as much as he would have liked. It was a good way for him to test out farm stays and what he would do differently. Um, but they're also travelers. So that's, I think, why they chose that route for their, their initial. Um, is it okay to cross list between, say, Tenter and say you have uh, the turnkey solution that you've gotten? Can you then turn around and also list on the others. Absolutely. A, a lot of people do that. Um, but that does go back to, let's see, when we were talking about calendar syncing, um, a lot of people do tend to list on multiple sites. And that's what's going to bring you. When I've talked to farmers, they find sites like Airbnb and VRBO are the ones that keep their calendars fairly full, but they like the people that come in from Hip Camp or Tenter because those are the people that want the experience more and they, they don't expect to just be left alone when they come there. Um, but that's very much where you need to think about your calendar syncing or a way to keep track of making sure you do not double book. Um, hi, yeah, quick question. Um, you mentioned that booking.com has a separate farming platform. Um, I don't think you mentioned what that is. At Farm Stay Planet. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I, I noticed when, when I looked at that one, because I had considered putting it on here, it, it wasn't up in too many countries. And it's, I think you start listing with booking and booking.com automatically puts you onto that site was my understanding. They did not respond to me for my questions, which is, it's an, it's an aggregate, it's an aggregator site. Okay. So it's whatever they think the farm stay may be. Yes. <laughs> I have a comment on that though. Because I searched for fun last night and booking.com somehow got me into their stream and it was full of stuff that had nothing to do with farms and agriculture. And it's very interesting and trusted. Okay, that, that was my my experience with it as we <laughs> as I was researching. I, I have a quick question. So I, I love the fact that looking for calendars to sync because like Scotty mentioned, that would be my nightmare being overbooked. How, how do you know if it's syncing? Does it list who else or how, how can you tell if you're safe? So Scotty, you might be able to talk to the, talk about this a little bit more um, or you, <laughs> yeah. Some of them, some of them, it's obvious. <laughs> was my understanding. Yeah, and and so remember, you have to go both ways. And so you'll know because you'll be able to see. You you get messages. It's not like people book and you don't know that they booked. And so you can see that it's syncing that way. And you can also practice. You can talk to them to try to make sure that you've got it all worked out. I also wanted to say that Airbnb and Verbo talk about farm stays all the time. And if you look and see what those listings are, they aren't farm stays. So. Some people have hijacked that term recently. I have a, just one question from online, uh, wondering if you did any research on Wolf International. I did not do on that one. That one was pointed out to me um, recently, but I have not done research on that specific site yet. Is it? It's a work exchange. So. Yeah. Sure, sure. It's not a question. I just wanted to um, also mention uh, workaway.com. It's like Wolf, but it's much broader. Um, and so that's a global farm stay 
option for like two weeks to a month, not so much as long as woofing. And my, my understanding with those sites, they're ones that you actually trade work for your stay. Okay. So it's not in a way it's income to the farm, but in a way, in the way of labor is my understanding, which is kind of why I left them off the site when I started looking them up or off this tool. Right. Thanks, Angela. Thank you so much. <laughs>